Hello, welcome to the October session of the um, MNO information session. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Lisa Strasbaugh, Assistant Director of Admissions at the Jack Joseph and Morton Mandel School of Applied Social Sciences, and we thank you for joining us. Um, this evening, I have the pleasure of having two colleagues joining me, the uh, Director of the MNO program, Dr. Robert Fisher, and one of our alum, Dr. Um, I'm going to give you a promotion, um, Claire Levine, alum of the class of 2020. And so um, I'll just take this opportunity to ask Dr. Fisher and Claire to introduce themselves just a little bit. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, good to see you all tonight. Uh, I'm Rob Fisher. I'm an associate professor here at the Mandel School. I've been at Mandel for uh, over 20 years, and I've directed our master's in nonprofit organizations degree for the last uh, 10 or so years. I teach courses in program evaluation, program design, and uh, database decision making for nonprofit leaders. So look forward to the conversation. Claire? Thanks, Dr. Fisher. Hi, everyone. My name is Claire Levin. So like Lisa said, I'm a 2020 graduate of the Mandel School. Um, very proud alumni. But I um, am currently actually down in Columbus, Ohio, as the Assistant Director of Corporate Development Analytics for Nationwide Children's Hospitals Foundation. So I support prospecting donors um, from those different areas, a little different than individual giving can be. Um, before that, I was in Cleveland for four years working for a youth workforce development organization, um, doing some advocacy work, board governance, um, and different strategic planning support. And then um, I was working there while a student in the Mandel School, and it was a pretty great experience to have that professional experience at the same time of my graduate studies. Um, I'm, I'm working in reverse with my timeline, but uh, I did two years of an AmeriCorps program after completing my undergraduate degree at Ohio State. And the really common thread in all of my work is it's focused on youth development in some way, shape or form. So it's been education, workforce, and now healthcare. So excited to answer some questions and lend some insight. Great, thank you both so very much. So um, we are um, gonna move forward with the presentation and I'm actually gonna ask Dr. Fisher um, if he doesn't mind forwarding the screen. Um, so I am um, traveling as well. Um, generally when I'm doing these um, uh, sessions, I have two screens and I'm able to um, move us forward. But if Dr. Fisher is able to take us to the next slide. Um, this is um, the primary building where um, many of the MNO courses take place um, here in Cleveland. Um, it's the Jack Joseph M. Morton Mandel Community um, uh, Services Center, Studies Center, pardon me, um, located on Bellflower. And our other building is um, just down the way also um, on Bellflower. Lisa, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to plead ignorance here. I don't think I can advance these slides since you, sh you shared them. Okay. If I yeah. had shared them, I think I could, but. All right, so let me. There we go. So yeah. sorry, folks. Sorry. Thank you for your patience. So these are just the, the contact information and the bio. And I did want to mention, even though it was in the email, that we will be sending um, the recording of this so that you will have the contact information um, and um, if you have follow-up, um, you certainly will be able to um, reach any of us. So some highlights of the MNO degree. So um, first of all, I wanted to um, make sure that everyone was aware that this um, master's degree is a fully in-person um, experience. Um, it is not a hybrid, nor is it an online program. And so I actually wanted to, to jump right in and actually ask Dr. Fisher and Claire to talk about what are the advantages um, of having a fully on, um, fully in-person um, academic program at a graduate level specific to uh, a nonprofit space. Well, I'll offer an instructor's take on this. And obviously, we've all spent the last four years kind of in this transition between with with new thinking honestly about what online uh, participation looks like in lots of meetings and and education 
So we're still in flux, but the m &O has, for now, uh, we're in our 35th year of the degree program, has been an in-person learning experience from the very beginning. And we've maintained it primarily to try to just keep the, um, the interactional uh, component of the, of, of the coursework very much alive. So you'll find that a lot of the classes involve uh, team projects, um, you know, breakout sessions, interactive kind of um, work, uh, guest lectures, that sort of thing. And, you know, at least for now, we are we are continue to I, I, I want to keep open the door that, <laughs> you know, there may be some transition looming. And, and I certainly have aspirations to move, have the uh, entire degree offered online as well. So I'm not, I'm not in no way trying to poo poo the idea that it could be online. But right now, this is where we're at. Claire, would you say anything about your experience? I know yeah. you were, you were with us, at least partly through the pandemic. Well, actually, I finished my studies in December, like I finished in the winter. Oh, so I actually oh, just, I just missed everything. Yeah, um, yeah. But I'd say a huge asset to the graduate program is the network that you create with your peers as well as the instructors. Um, with the nonprofit world in general, it's so relational um, in how you do the work and how you're successful in the work, especially when you collaborate across organizations, not just within your own. So it's been invaluable, like having my peer group and seeing where people have landed just in the three years since we've completed our program. Um, as well as engaging with the speakers that have come in and talked. Um, like I think of my board governance class and I'm pretty sure there was an, an, a unique speaker every single class we had. Um, and that networking is just invaluable to like my professional development. Um, yeah, and some of the intensive weekend courses almost felt like it was semi online with just like how much of the work took place outside of the classroom. Um, and so, I feel like it never just felt like you're, we were working in four walls. You still kind of had the community as your classroom. So it's something I really valued. Great, thanks so very much. I think that it is important to talk about, um, you know, the strengths of the in-person. Certainly um, online has, its, has a place and currently, um, as Dr. Fisher said, um, this this degree is fully in person. And so it is offered um, in terms of flexibility, and we will um, talk about this in some some future slides. But I just did want to mention that um, and that Claire shared that the courses are offered sort of in the traditional once a week grad school model, you know, 430 to six o'clock um, once a week. But there also is this weekend offering where it's an immersive Friday, Saturday, Sunday um, experience. So there is some flexibility in terms of um, that modality. Um, and certainly when you're um, covering coursework in an intensive week, that it, it is utilizing a little bit of a flipped model in that you are doing, you know, considerable readings and such before you're getting to the classroom. And yet we, we really don't want to diminish, we really want to um, focus on the strength of um, the, the students in the classroom are bringing um, great experiences themselves. And so it's not just the stellar faculty providing the content, it is um, your classmates um, contributing to, to the experience, um, especially given where they might be coming from a very different nonprofit um, perspective and, and you might be able to really uh, gain a great deal um, in your interactions with, um, with a colleague, with a, a class classmate. So we did want to um, focus on the unique components of um, the m and program here at the Mandel School. Um, we are one of 13 accredited graduate um, programs in nonprofit um, in the world. Um, and so that accreditation um, we are certainly very proud of, sets us apart. Um, we do draw faculty from a variety of dis different disciplines, um, schools, and vantage points. And so um, that is important, and yet that is the um, that is the diversity, that is the um, the interdisciplinary nature, and yet everything is within a nonprofit space. So we certainly are familiar with um, other programs um, across the nation um, that provide a, a smattering of courses in nonprofit, but everything, um, um, all of the courses, 
all of the readings, all of the conversations will be exclusive um, to the nonprofit space as opposed to um, perhaps a coursework that a course that might be um, taught as a um, profit course and then just tweaked a little bit. And so I think that that's important to know that that would be um, the vision. And it is a unique um, positioning to be placed um, in a School of Applied Social Sciences. Um, Dr. Fisher, could you talk a little bit about um, how that um, contributes to the the uniqueness of the program and to the coursework? Yeah, and to pick up a little bit on what you said, Lisa, you know, as you look across the country at where nonprofit management uh, is taught at universities, it's a it's a relatively uh, young uh, profession, really stemming from the the 1980s, and we were one of the first universities to offer a full blown masters. Most of the coursework is going to be scattered across schools of public administration, schools of business administration, that might have a, a handful of courses that they call a nonprofit concentration. We felt like it needed to have its own, um, you know, dedicated uh, agenda in its curriculum um, because the nonprofit sector is so very different from either government service or or the for profit arena. So, uh, you know, I think if you if you look at the content of our coursework, there's no question in any master's program that has management in the title. There's, there's going to be some content that is very similar, such as finance, such as, uh, you know, policy environment, um, strategic thinking, um, uh, governance issues. The difference is in the focus and the, it goes down to the, what the instructor brings to the classroom and what examples they use, what the case studies look like. So we built all our courses from the nonprofit perspective, um, and we all our instructors are steeped in the sector, either as people who have studied the nonprofit sector, like me, that are more academically framed, and people who have led in nonprofit organizations, people like Claire's becoming, um, former executive directors, folks who have consulted extensively with nonprofits. So we try to balance that with you know, who you meet in the classroom um, and who they bring into the classroom. It's not just, here's a bunch of theories about how the nonprofit sector works. Here's what people um, who are doing this work day to day will tell you about how those theories are working in the field. Great, thanks Dr. Fisher. So we wanted to provide a bit of an overview. Um, obviously, I mentioned just a bit ago that the, the format of delivery is both in an evening, late afternoon, we'll call it evening, um, as well as weekend. And so the degree is offered. So there is a, a master's of nonprofit organization, and there also is a, um, a certificate that is available. And so um, there is a great deal of flexibility in terms of coursework and in terms um, of either full-time or part-time, um, as well as, and we'll talk about this in a bit, but if we're, since we're focusing here for a moment on flexibility, um, it is a, a pro an academic program and degree and certificate that does have a year-round start. Um, so we do uh, begin in the fall, spring, and summer. And so in academics, when we refer to spring, we actually mean January, which is a, a little bit of a... Um, an oxymoron in the Cleveland area, um, but that would be um, the first um, opportunity for you as a prospective student to be able to join us um, in January, but you certainly are welcome to join us um, in the summer or in fall. So back to the curriculum just a bit. Um, so for the, a student that would be interested in enrolling full-time, um, it is a three-semester um, academic program. Um, there are eight required courses and five electives. Um, we do have the opportunity um, if someone was um, currently enrolled um, at Case Western Reserve University and wanted to participate in the three plus one, that's an opportunity specifically for um, a Case Western Reserve University undergraduate student. Um, and we are going to talk a little bit um, about the certificate. Um, 
I wondered if if either one of you had any comments besides the fact of just mentioning that the certificate is 15 credit hours. And so I'll just sort of do a, a little bit of a compare and a contrast. So the degree has eight required courses. The certificate has one required course. So um, there's certainly a contrast between the, the amount of time. Um, but certainly you have the opportunity as a prospective student to enroll in a part-time um, in either the certificate or the degree. Um, and really that's sort of an independent, um, um, not particularly um, structured in terms of the courses that you take. Um, but I, I would love to have some conversation again from Dr. Fisher about his thoughts about um, the differences between the degree and the certificate and to share with our students um, so often what happens with our certificate folks. Um, and I'll, I'll let you share that piece. Oh, well, I guess I would say, you know, I always recommend the certificate for somebody who already has a master's under their belt, because, you know, in terms of the benefit that you get with your employer, sometimes just having a master's is going to get you the ability to advance. Um, and then if you want to show a particular um, aptitude and expertise in the practice of nonprofit management, a certificate would be ideal. For folks who haven't done a master's, I'll say that the certificate is essentially the gateway drug to the master's <laughs> degree. <laughs> because what they, they almost always, uh, when they're getting concluding the certificate after, say, two semesters, are, are wishing they could take more coursework and will... Uh, will readily convert over to doing the master's, which is a fairly uh, painless process. Um, in terms of the global universe at the Mandel School, we have roughly 75 students that are pursue, pursuing um, the master's degree in nonprofit management. Um, about 25 or so of those are doing a dual degree with us, uh, social work and nonprofit management. And then of the folks who are just doing the MO degree, 60% are are working full time and pursuing their their coursework part time meaning they're taking probably two courses a semester and they're going to um you know finish the degree in in roughly three and a half years we have a small group i would say of students who are doing it full time trying to finish their masters the mno in three semesters doing you know, 15 credit hours in two semesters and nine in a summer term. Um, so done in a year. Um, but we, we're very flexible on meeting you where you're at in terms of how to make sure you get the courses you need on a schedule that works for you. Um, you know, when you have courses that are uh, intensive weekend and there's a weekend and you're, you have to be at a wedding or you've got a family vacation that doesn't work. You know, we, we are always trying to make sure that you can get the course requirements done in a way that works for your real life. And I, I just add from my experience, cause I was just trying to do math and figure out how many classes I must have taken. Cause I, I finished the degree in four semesters. So fall, spring, summer, fall um while working full time and it to me with where like my personal obligations outside of work and everything um it was a commitment for that timeline I said no to things um and it was my time to be selfish I'd say I was like this is my time to focus on me um but with that said I never missed like a major family milestone or anything that went with it so like I was it didn't feel I was surprised when you said the average rate is a little longer because it didn't feel as long to me um, or it didn't feel like it wasn't manageable. So if anything, yeah. I think while working full time, I was able to directly apply what I was doing in the classroom into my professional work. And my direct supervisor was incredibly supportive of me pursuing my degree. So I would encourage people if you're in a position to work full time, it's just, it was the greatest homework was just taking it into my work life. So. And I, I, I may have misspoke. I may have said three. Did I say three and a half years? Two and a half is. So if you think about it, uh, folks are taking usually two spring, one summer, two fall. That's five courses. The degree requires 13 courses. So two full years plus one semester, essentially. And Suzanne, your, your question about the certificate 
the way the certificate works is there's one required class and then you select four electives from our offerings. So every student makes a different version of the certificate based on their needs. Some students want to specialize in things related to fundraising, some more like general governance issues of organizations. Um, some are really into data and evaluation. So we just uh, kind of work out what's the best set of four electives. Blair, given that the degree is 39 credit hours, if you completed it in four semesters, um, you were taking about 10 credit hours. So certainly you were in, enrolled in weekend courses as well as weekly. And so I was wondering if you might provide some comments about your preferred um, format and sort of just to give um, prospective students a sense, a sense, especially because the weekend format is, is rather innovative, um, of what that looked like for you and if you had a preference. Yeah, from recollection, I feel like I was in, at a given time, it was like two standard like weekly normal classes and maybe one intensive that semester and maybe two, I depending on when the offering was. Um, they're different. So I don't think I have like an extreme preference. It was just the work looked different and the expectations looked different. Um, I would say preparation for the intensive weekends, like you are doing a disservice to yourself if you don't walk in on day one making sure that you've taken it upon yourself to be prepared for that class. Um, and that tended to be more project-based with groups, more collaboration. People have mixed feelings about group projects. It brings out the best and worst of humanity. Um, but I'd say when it works well, it works really well. Um, uh, we would meet still to a degree every couple weeks uh, to get the work done at like a Panera or somewhere that made sense for the group. Um, or sometimes just collaborate like asynchronously and get things done on a shared document. Um, then with the weekly classes, I'd say they're a bit more standard for what your expectations may be for a classroom space. Um, but even I'm trying to remember with some of my weeklies, I think some still had field trips, like we would do a tour um, occasionally. So you weren't always just in the classroom space. Um, still some group projects also within that weekly time. Um, and I would just say if anyone has any feelings about public speaking, you definitely get over that through this degree. You get plenty of opportunities to present. Um, and I would say I'm now someone who's pretty confident in that area, but I didn't have that practice at the time. And I think it, that also added to my confidence in my professional setting as well. Um, I don't know if I fully answered the question, but I don't think I had a preference. It's just they offered, there was different pros and cons to either. Great, thanks very much. So I would imagine that many of um, you on the call um, are coming to us from very different places in life, professionally or academic degrees, um, but we did want to just sort of highlight um, the great diversity and really the when I, I do these sessions and meet with students and really think about nonprofit and, and the degree, I keep on coming back to the words of flexible, flexible, interdisciplinary, um, broadness, um, and so really the degree is a, um, can really be a door opener for a um, great many positions. Um, we have, a, as uh, Dr. Fisher said, a great variety of faculty who are teaching. Um, and so these are just some examples of where our students go and what they actually, the work that they perform. Um, so our nonprofit degree um, is competency based. Um, this is um, super critical that you are um, investing in um, an academic program that is is based on um, competencies. And so these are the competencies that we um, structure the curriculum um, and seek to um, to include all of the components um, to. Um, for it to be as broad and to provide both depth and breadth to the program. Sorry, I'm just gonna jump on the chat here and um, I will go ahead and, all right, I'll continue on. I've been, I've been trying to punch a few answers in there. Thanks so much. 
<laughs> Thanks so much. We get so I get so used to having two screens, so I appreciate Absolutely. that. Okay. Um, so um, as Dr. Fisher had mentioned, um, we do have a, a specific um, listing of required courses for the degree as well as electives. And so I love this slide just because it does um, it does um, provide a very specific listing of a great number of electives. I think that many um, graduate degrees, um, you know, provide many, many, many required courses, and then you don't really have the opportunity to kind of personalize it. And depending on where you are professionally, if you have a clear vision, um, the way that our um, curriculum is structured, it provides um, a, a great deal of flexibility. I would I would add, and now I'm I'd be interested to hear uh, what Claire would lift up from her own experience. But you might be surprised to see law and finance in there, maybe not, but those are two courses that are, I would say, um, sensitive spots for a lot of the students we attract. There's either like a fear of finance, this applies to the data course a little bit as well. Maybe that's not something students have a great affinity for. Um, and that's why these courses are so critical because nonprofit management folks, when they get out in their organizations, need to be able to supervise people who have deep expertise in areas that they may not be comfortable in. And, you know, to be able to talk some of the language, understand the worldview and the context for so it's it's not to say that we expect you to go out and be able to uh, be the person who makes the budget or, you know, files the 990 form or, you know, make some analysis, but you may well be the person who hires the contractors, the consultants who do that work for an organization. And so we specifically have built those in from the very beginning of our master's degree, and we have designed them to be, um, you know, the accessible way to, you know, knock down those fears and just get in there and do the work and get comfortable with it. Um, things like strategic planning, our students, that, that's something everybody feels comfortable going into. They're excited about it. Um, leadership dialogues, you know, same kind of thing, ethics and professionalism. Those are courses that students um, aren't particularly worried about. And I think you will still find that they get deep learning from them. Great. I, it's interesting to hear it from the faculty perspective, because I would say a lot of what you just said, like resonates with how I felt as a student. Like there's sort of that imposter syndrome or fear of what we assume, at least for me in my experience, the finance class and law were the two I was concerned about. And the only way I like mindfully handled that was I just made sure I put them in different semesters so I could focus at one at a time. Law was in my first semester. Like I don't remember when I took most classes, but I definitely remember when I took law and financial management. <laughs> um, with law, it's interesting because I know some of the offerings and correct me if I'm wrong, this may not be the case, but I know there was one session that was with law students in the law program. And then yeah. there was a session that I was in that was just Mandel students. And so that's an interesting experience too, because your peer group in the class are people pursuing legal degrees. Um, but I've, I'm shocked already three years out from my degree how often my brain has referred to content from that class or um, I've been in situations that I never even knew would be affected and I've actually been able to add value in the room which is significant to me that as a younger member of like a senior leadership team I was someone that could have provided valuable counsel and that's the biggest added value to me getting my degree when I did we work the nonprofit field. You don't need a graduate degree to like advance necessarily, depending on the role you're in um, or the organization you work for. But it definitely gets you into leadership positions and and put, um, opportunities to like be more strategic. I would say quicker, um, and it gives you that like additional like like not that you have authority, but just authority on a subject matter. It's very validating. Um, financial management was definitely intimidating at the time. But it, it was very palatable. Um, I she, that was actually one of my favorite instructors. I had Jamika Holloway. Still remember her name because I enjoyed the class. Um, and with things like board governance and being able to support 
um, a board of directors, having that financial like fluency is important, if anything, just to ask questions to those that may be experts um, and to get the right counsel. So although they may seem intimidating, depending on your interests, skills, and background, they've, they've already been invaluable for me and my professional experience. Claire, can I just um, ask you to put a pin on it? Is there any particular course that either was not as enjoyable or you did not anticipate that it would be as helpful and now um, as a professional, you are, are um, finding that it, it was surprisingly valuable? Um, I didn't know where my career was going to go. So actually with Dr. Fisher, database decision-making, like my role now in is skews the data analytics direction. Um, and I would have never guessed that for myself. Like I would have never thought I'd move in that direction, but I do prospect research and I do a lot of work in our database. And I'm still, I was explaining this to Dr. Fisher going into this discussion today, but I'm learning a lot on the job um, through different trainings offered for like continuous education through my work, through my role now. But it's not that I dislike database decision-making. I just didn't realize how it permeates. It, it permeates into like everything that you do. And especially with technology, the way it is, it can be manipulated in the wrong way if you don't have the right um, lens with which you're interpreting it. So I think I was just surprised where my career pivoted as opposed to what, what I thought a class would be like. Mm -hmm. Love those, those student views in the rear view mirror. Um, and I'd say there were certain classes when I was picking, like I'm not so far in my career. I haven't been frontline programs, like program design, things like that. It's not something that like I sought out because it's not something that I thought was on my career path, but like board governance was probably my favorite class I took because it was directly related to my role at the time and so applicable. Um, and I, to this day, think I'm always going to enjoy when you have a good board board governance. <laughs> right. Great. So I saw that someone had asked in the chat, and so I just wanted to provide the visual, although Dr. Fisher answered the question. So the one required course is nonprofit leadership dialogues. And then this is just a sample of the electives. From the faculty point of view, could you um, give some thought about when um, a student who would be new to Mandel and new to the certificate will say when they would enroll in, in um, SAS 411? Oh, we, we recommend whether for certificate students or uh, MNO degree students, uh, we want that SAS 411 in the first semester because we do consider it. Uh, we don't have an intro course per se, but that's that's the one that acquaints students with the widest range of issues um, that are going to be um, focused on more deeply in several of the other um, remaining courses. So that's a first semester course for sure. Great, thank you. So we did wanna talk a little bit about um, the Mandel School um, student success model. So all students enrolled in coursework are, are assigned a um, student advancement specialist. Um, so that person um, is here during the week as well is um, physically present um, on uh, occasional weekends um, when courses are running. Um, for students, um, just in terms of they are sort of your ombudsman, um, they do not have that title, but really they're your kind of go-to in terms of if you're having difficulties with a particular platform or um, navigating something that you could certainly support, um, you could seek out support from one of those um, team members. And you'll have that team member your entire time as a student. Um, we do have nine research and training centers. Um, I like to share with students that not only are fac faculty um, ex exemplary in the classroom, but they are um, they are active research researchers themselves. Um, so that's my opportunity to ask um, um, our modest um, Dr. Fisher to talk a little bit about his um, his research and what he's engaged in and what matters to him. If you don't mind. Well, my my uh, research is largely housed at the center I direct, which is the Center on Poverty and Community Development. Uh, and we do a wide variety of applied research projects with uh, nonprofits, uh, foundations, um, 
city, county government, um, some federal awards, and they're all focused on neighborhoods and programs that are usually designed to improve the conditions for families that have been uh, experiencing poverty um, and its various um, deleterious uh, effects. So just as an example, currently we're heavily involved in studying the effects of lead uh, abatement uh, work in Cleveland. Cleveland adopted a civic ordinance uh, now three years ago to require all rental housing um, to be lit, certified lead safe. And we are serving as the external evaluator for the city of Cleveland, monitoring the implementation of that. And then actually we'll be doing a study um, using child lead testing data to examine whether this has worked in some sense. And we also have a federally funded study that I'm leading on youth homelessness in our region, looking at uh, what are better ways to assess the size and characteristics of youth between the ages of 13 and 26 who have housing instability and homelessness in our region. So it's, uh, you know, to me, my research is uh, plays directly into the courses I teach. I bring in a lot of current and uh, often issues that I'm confronting working with community partners who very, have very different perspectives um, on uh, what the research could look like and what the use might be. And that's, uh, I want to be quick to say that um, we are we are not, we very much value the community perspective. So we, we hear a lot about research to practice, but we also think, you know, practice informed research is in some ways the most usable kind of evidence that we can produce to improve policy, improve practice, improve the well-being of communities. Great. Thanks, Dr. Fisher. Mm -hmm. So I um, did want to mention that um, the Mandel School is very proud to host one of the exclusive um, social work and nonprofit management libraries, um, literally in our um, in the, one of the two buildings that um, compose the Mandel School. And so we have three full time librarians. Um, who are there to be a resource for you. And so um, you certainly could use the university's very fine um, library just on the other, a little bit down the way, um, not really on the other side of campus, but a little bit down the way. Um, but really all of the resources that you will need are located in the Harris Library. Um, and that the librarians themselves are, are such a great um, resource to students. Um, we also provide a complimentary um, membership um, to our Nova. I just renewed mine and it wasn't cheap. So I think that's a really great benefit um, that we provide to our students. Um, so I'd be remiss in not talking a bit about Cleveland. Um, we do have students that are coming to us. Um, you know, we're a, a um, the world is getting smaller in some ways. We certainly have students at Mandel that are driving a bit of a distance um, to join us. So perhaps um, we, it is likely that we might have a student from Pittsburgh or Columbus um, or Erie, Pennsylvania that might not be familiar with Cleveland. Um, but um, Cleveland is a, a, what we'd like to call a small big city in that um, it is a combination of a rich cultural, um, location, um, specifically um, Case Western Reserve is located in University Circle. Um, I, I tease people and say, if I had a throwing arm, which I do not, um, I could hit the art museum or the VA or um, a variety of other um, cultural um, museums um, that are sort of abut our campus. And so it's really a, a lovely place. And yet we still are about 11 minutes from downtown Cleveland. Um, and that provides us in terms of students, um, students that are um, coming to us from many, many um, nonprofits um, who are employed full-time, um, as Dr. Fisher mentioned, that, that most of our students um, are enrolled part-time um, in the degree or the certificate, and therefore they're bringing their rich experiences from, um, from working in Cleveland. 
So I would be remiss if we didn't also talk about scholarships. Um, so we do provide um, a level of scholarship support. And so um, the Mandel Foundation enables us to provide um, some level of scholarship support to all students. Um, and one of the um, components and decisions that was made that I personally appreciate is that we inform our students at the time of admission what their scholarship level is. And so um, I think that that speaks to our level of integrity and transparency and wanting to let students know the investment that um, they'll be taking and so that they'll be able to um, make the decisions in terms of resources or loans or investigating um, employer reimbursement so that they're not surprised. Um, so at the time of admission, um, that, that scholarship amount um, is communicated in writing. Um, we do have um, one dedicated financial aid staff for about 400 students um, at the Mandel School. And so compared to other areas, that is a really exceptional um, student to staff um, level. And so um, Julie Painter, Assistant Director of Financial Aid, um, is the exclusive contact um, person and so she really understands the curriculum and how um, how it works um, and is able to um, better support um, the students enrolled in our coursework. I'm and not sure if anyone is an AmeriCorps alumni here or City or Peace Corps, but in addition to the scholarship I received, it it's very seamless with applying your Siegel Education Award from your AmeriCorps service. And quite honestly, if I wasn't a city or core member, I don't know if I would have gone to grad school because that investment in my education kind of snowballed um, into me opening and considering this opportunity. So very grateful for that as well. Yeah, some of our city year um, and AmeriCorps and Peace Corps students are um, bring such rich experiences um, and we, they are certainly very valuable members. I'm actually um, flying to San Jose to visit with the city or folks out there um, in a couple of days just to talk about um, possibly um, encouraging some of their students to, um, to come to Cleveland and enroll in some of our courses. So we'll, we'll see, but we, 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 are, um, we love our city or students. <clears throat> One of the components that I also wanted to, um, as we sort of work through the winding up our session here is that um, the scholarship um, process does not require an, an, an additional form. Um, when you apply for admission, you are applying for all of our scholarships, which leads me to the application requirement. Um, we do not require um, a, um, a GRE, we do not require an application fee, and so we really are trying to remove barriers um, for students. I actually unfortunately didn't have time to update this slide, but we actually very recently made the decision to even modify uh, and reduce barriers a bit more. So this slide indicates that we are requiring um, two letters of reference, and so um, we actually are um, recommending two letters of re reference, but we are requiring one. And so if we had your transcripts, your three to five page essay, your professional resume, and um, one online recommendation, we would consider your application complete and um, it would begin the review process and would um, go to the admissions committee. We really didn't want you know, sometimes, you know, you're, you're emailing folks and they're busy or it's a, a tech issue or what have you. Um, and we just uh, made the decision um, for, um, for this academic year um, to move forward with only requiring one letter of reference. We do, however, um, require um, a very important three to five page essay. And so the prompt um, is provided here. It's also certainly on our website and it obviously it's within the application, providing you the opportunity to um, share with us your particular perspectives and passions and what brings you specifically to the nonprofit space. And so we would like to hear about um, experiences and factors as well as um, a discussion of the forces um, and priorities or challenges um, that we are facing in terms of nonprofits. Um, so that's just sort of a, um, a preview of what's to come um, were you to be applying. 
Um, and now I see I have lots of things in the chat and we technically have about 10 or 15 minutes. And so I can, um, we can go ahead and um, um, work through the chat. Well, the first, the, the first thing I would say is Case Western Reserve is too expensive. It's <laughs> it's expensive. There's no there's no I'm not, I'm not going to sit here as the director of a of a nonprofit management degree and not agree that you know the tuition is high as a as a tier 1 university uh, that's that is a feature. The, the only good news is that the Mandel School we have the lowest tuition at Case Western Reserve University, <laughs> but it's still it's it's the biggest threat I think to students that are interested in joining us here. And I put in the in the chat that our you know our average student scholarship is thirty percent. That's thirty percent from us from the school. They might students do get other scholarship support from other sources, as Claire mentioned. Some have uh, military benefits or, um, you know, the service service programs. Um, and then student loans. We will help identify the best path forward um, for financing your education. I know it's a little, it's not very consoling to say, you know, higher education is an investment in you. It is so it is it's not just a something you're buying to enjoy um it is going to pay off we believe in your career path and you the compensation you'll be able to draw but it is a it's still going to be expensive um so there was a question about the cost of the certificate you know you can get our credit hour cost at times you know the 15 credits of the certificate and it's going to it's going to be roughly $22,000 full freight but you know take off the scholarship you know it's it's sitting down with Julie and saying okay what's the best what's what I'm what's the lowest cost I can get this at that's going to hit my pocketbook or hit you know my be pain, painful for me in the short term and you know that's that's how how it works. We'll do our best and our, you know, we are cut our dean spends probably half his time out figuring out how we get more scholarship dollars mm -hmm. in the door, either from individual donors or partners who want to bring down the price point for students that want to study with us. And that's just job one. It's true. It is an investment. It is um a bit of an oxymoron in terms of of um, you're preparing to do the good work of working for a nonprofit, and yet um, you're paying a, a private university um, tuition. But I would have to say, I, I just, I guess I keep on, I, I hope I'm not just preaching to myself, but I do think that the flexibility of the coursework lends itself not just in your personal life, but also in your economics. So, you know, certainly there are limitations. We we wouldn't allow a student to take five years to, you know, to complete the certificate. Um, however, there is the ability to um, make some thoughtful decisions um, when courses are offered um, and knowing what your finances and what your bandwidth is. But it is certainly, there is certainly a momentum that is important um, and that we certainly do not want to encourage students to have to stop out um, you know, but I, I think that once students begin, really, as as Dr. Fisher said, you know, then then it's kind of hard to stop folks at the certificate level because it's just so satisfying that they decide to, um, you know, to to join us for the whole degree. And so I guess I would encourage people to just um, to go ahead. And even for the certificate, um, I didn't have the slide, um, but it is certainly on our website. But the um, the admissions requirements are more simple for the certificate. Um, and so um, I can pop that into the chat just so that folks um, folks have that at hand but it's 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 embedded into the into the website so if when you go in and toggle like you know select lisa strasbaugh certificate of mno then you're only going to be asked for um for certain pieces of documentation so we try to make that um that portion of the process 
um, a bit more reasonable. Um, so. Just to share, because I haven't heard it mentioned yet. So, and be, to be candid and like honest. So about, I was personally responsible for about 50% of my tuition and 50 was covered through my combination of scholarships, which is part of the reason I did choose to continue and go to the Mandel School because without that 50%, that wouldn't have been possible, but it made it more attainable for me. Um, and then I have government loans for the remainder. And I would just encourage anyone who is looking for to take on a student loan to go the government path in the sense of public service loan forgiveness. And if you know you're going to stay within the, the nonprofit sector or work for the government or whatever your future may hold, um, knowing that I'm not on the hook for the full value of what I may owe with interest is really relieving to me. And that um, public service loan forgiveness forgives my remaining balance after 10 years of payments or 120 payments. And already I'm over a third of the way through that program, just being three years out of the grad school. So if you are gonna take on student loans, I would encourage you to go through the government and not a private loan because you qualify for that program. Great. Thanks very much, Claire. I appreciate you sharing that. So I did want to add um, a little bit of, of um, specificity about um, full-time um, Case Western Reserve universities. Do um, Employees do receive tuition waivers, and so they are structured um, and limited or provided, depending on the way you look at it. Um, it's six credit hours in the fall, six credit hours in the spring, and then three credit hours in the summer. And so um, we certainly, obviously, those of us who work at at case, it is a nonprofit. And so certainly we encourage um, we encourage um, many of our 3,000 um, staff colleagues across the university to enroll in the coursework and understand um, in, in, and look at the environment in which we um, in which in which we work um, within with a different lens. So that is certainly an option um, for those people who um, who work at the university. All right, are there any more questions of um, specifically of Claire or of Dr. Fisher or of myself? Um, I think that I had a final slide, but I jumped out of it. So um, for those folks that were thinking about joining us um, in January, there is a December 1st deadline. And um, I can't tell you, I haven't memorized the other two date, the two deadlines, I think, uh, April, perhaps, maybe April 15th feels about right for um, joining us in May and then July, if you wanted to join um, to join us in fall. Those are on the website. I apologize that I do not have those memorized. Lectures and talks open to the public. Oh, wow. The, P the personal PD that exists at the Mandel School. Um, yeah, we, we have a friends of the Mandel School listserv. That's what we should. I know. I would just say that honestly, going on to our website, I don't think that we actually have a particular. There is so much um, content on the front most of the of these um, case um, backslash. Um, I guess social work because that's the front front of the website that uh, that sort of communicates all of our activities of uh, a variety of, of and all of and all those events that Mandel puts on are are free and open to the oh, public. Oh yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And and very very many of them are, are are virtual as well as in person. So we certainly um, encourage those um, you know those of you that are, that have the proximity that are able to join us in person for for any of those. Uh, include including this weekend is homecoming and i know we we have a panel we is that do. are we are we live streaming that i don't know i am a little out of touch because i'm going to be in oh California. you're out of town yeah in which i'm so disappointed because i i really hope that we're going to record that panel it it sounds like it's I'll, I'll, be I'll check on that okay that would be that would be a great resource to share um with myself and and prospective students i'm sure any final words of wisdom, Claire, if you looked in the rear view mirror, anything you'd like to say to yourself or, or words to this audience? 
I don't think I could like press enough how important like the network of people was and the quality of my classmates and instructors and our instructors networks as they brought in different speakers um especially the opportunities to like essentially consult when doing some of the projects for the courses and you're making a model of a strategic plan um for an organization and they're actually putting into practice like just making the most of those experiences and engagement has been like the un the i guess uh unintended not consequence is not the right word but like positive benefit that you don't see on like a course list but um people are doing pretty incredible things and it's very exciting to be a part of it and already paths have crossed a lot um i remember talking to one of my classmates at the time who was in a position looking to leave and now he's very successful in an organization like I introduced him to on a whim, didn't happen right away. And three years later, he is working for that organization. So I think everyone has like that best interest of the peer group at heart. And it wasn't on the Cleveland slide, like as a flashing light, but there's so much nonprofit history in Cleveland with like community foundations um, and like United Way and some of these very institutional organizations that like you won't see in another city and you won't be able to like be part of that story. So I just am very proud. Although I live in Columbus now, um, I'm so immensely proud and I could not be a bigger fan of Cleveland. So I'll be back one day. Don't worry. Um, but it's, it's the community that goes with the coursework that is really powerful. And just like with LeBron, we will have a parade, Claire, when you come back and welcome you. <laughs> Maybe you'll be on a future homecoming um in-person panel Claire I, I we'll see yeah, we'll Claire, see we will see all right Dr. Fisher any final comments no nope. feel free to reach out to me Lisa or Claire if you have follow specific follow-up questions thank you for making time tonight yeah we appreciate it so the way that our system works is that um, about 24 hours after I wrap up this Zoom, um, you will get an email with the link um, with this recording. And so you'll be able to have that as um, a resource, which has our emails. And Clara shared that it was um, most appropriate to contact her through LinkedIn. So go ahead and um, reach out. And um, I wish you a good day and um, be in touch. Thanks so much. Safe travels, Lisa. Yeah, right. thank you. Bye, Take care, everyone. Thanks, Claire. Thank you so much, Claire. Thanks for including me. I, still, I thought I was still muted for a sec. No, nope. I'm not. <laughs> okay. Good. Thank yeah. you so much. Have a great night.